I am so excited. I just had a pre-conversation with my guest, and I'm so excited to introduce you guys to Renee Warren, and I'll tell you why I'm excited in a moment. But let me give you background. She's an award-winning entrepreneur, angel investor, author, speaker, and founder of We Wild Women, a PR agency revolutionizing how female-led businesses shine in the media spotlight. Now, I'm going to finish reading this, and I'm going to explain why I have an entrepreneur and a PR person on the new method. Some of you are like, what the heck does this have to do with me? But hang tight. Renee is not just a leader. She's a visionary and in innovating how women can achieve unprecedented visibility and success. Maybe I should wear my glasses next time. As host of the top rated podcast, Into the Wild, make sure you go listen to that podcast, Into the Wild. She interviews successful entrepreneurs, sharing actionable authority building advice from those who have successfully done it before. And I met Renee because I was a guest on her show and she agreed to be a guest on my show. And the thing about Renee, so for those of you who have a business and need PR, by the end of this, you're calling Renee and you're hiring her. So that's the done deal. But for those of you who are like, why am I here? I don't have a business. You're still going to listen to Renee. And then you're going to want to have other people work with her because her thinking is our thinking. So I'm so excited. Welcome, Renee. Welcome to The New Method. Thank you. I'm so excited, Dr. E. Maybe I should be like Dr. R or something. Yeah, you should be Dr. R. I love <laughs> Dr. E, Dr. R. Dr. R. So the, the question she was very like, how do you do PR for your clinic? <laughs> really, we're not we're not talking about that. Not talking today. About that. <laughs> no, talking about that. So we're you know most of my audience was primarily female, usually around forty five to sixty five with some outliers, and they're struggling with their health, which is why they came to me. And health comes in many forms, right? So you have physical health, we have mental health, and all of it ties together. Right? I do a whole thing about the gut brain. But you recently had an experience that I want you to talk about where you really saw that entire connection coming through. So yeah, walk us through that. Okay, we're just going to jump right into it. Yeah. A month ago today, I had a procedure done that I've been thinking about doing for 30 years and spent the last five years doing in-depth research, calling doctors, figuring out what's the best thing to do, the best person to talk to, and if this is something I really want to do. So I had rhinoplasty done, and I kind of hid it from people. I hid the, the self-consciousness I had about my nose and my face. I didn't even talk to it about my, my husband, really. And I said to one day, I was like, I want to get my nose done. He's like, but you're beautiful the way you are. It's like the worst thing you can say to anybody that wants oh my God, yeah. to improve a thing. I'm like, yeah, I get it. This is just the one thing I want to fix. So anyway, we agreed on a date, found an incredible doctor and paid for it. And now the work came that I actually had to tell people near and dear to me that I was going to get this done because they're going to look at me and be like, you look different. It happened. What did you do? And so I told some close friends, I think people that just, it really mattered that they knew before they found out on social media. Everyone was super supportive and I was so shy to tell them. And they're like, go, oh, you do you, Renee. This is amazing. And I was scared to share it with my parents. So my parents are 78 ish, 79 years old. They've been married for over 50 years. It's like beautiful childhood, beautiful relationship. I admire them. And I did not want to offend them or insult them by saying I'm going to go get a nose job. So I called out my mom. This was two days prior to the surgery, even though I knew I was already doing this and had known for four months at this point. <laughs> so I called her up and she's like, oh, dad's at the gym. He's not home. What's up? And then we kind of talked about this date in August that she, her and dad wanted to come and visit us on the West Coast. And I said, you know what, mom, the reason for my call is this. On Tuesday, I'm going to get a nose job. And she and I was like, oh, my whole body tensed up, like, oh my gosh. And, and then she goes, oh, okay, well, when and what's the recovery like? And is Dan bringing you? Like, yeah, yep, yep, yep. The mom. And then she goes, so about those dates in August. So your dad and I were thinking. I go, what, mom? I just told you what I was doing. She's like, yeah, I heard you. I'll have your father call you when he gets home. An hour later, my dad called. The exact same thing happened. And then he called me back a couple hours later saying, hey, just I want you to know your mom and I were talking about this. And we both thought, you know, this is something that we thought you'd get done sooner. Wow. And not because they thought I had an ugly nose, but because they just know who I am. And was like, they were shocked that this. <gasps> I was like, so relieved. But then I'm like, was I overthinking this? Yes, I was. So sure. I go to Facebook because Facebook is more of like a closed community. I pretty much know everybody that's a friend on there. And I share the story about why I'm doing this. And I actually share the story. I remember this day. It was in seventh grade. And I had this little falling out with a friend. And there was like two guys that had a crush on this friend. And they, they were standing up for her. 
and they started making fun of my nose. And at this point, I had never actually looked at my nose in the mirror and thought it was anything substantial, but apparently it was big, according to them. According to them. His name was Mike, and the other guy's name was Dean, and I'll never forget them. All right, Mike and Dean, we're we're coming for you. The whole new method community is coming for you. Oh, Mike and Dean, you guys watch out. (laughs) So anyway, yeah, then I just built this complex around my nose. And for so many reasons, like, I'll I'll just put it off. Like, I I looked into it, then I put it off. I went to see doctors, and I called doctors, and I got all these renderings done, and then I put it off. Finally, I was like, why am I stalling? Mm -hmm. What am I resisting? Why am I avoiding the thing I want to do for me? Mm -hmm. Why is everybody else's opinion so important right now? And they didn't matter because when I posted that story on Facebook, you would not believe what happened. Not a single person said anything negative. Matter of fact, I got phone calls, text messages, DMs, emails from people saying, thank you so much for your vulnerability and sharing. I don't know if you knew, but I had three nose jobs. And I'm like, I did not know. And then... (laughs) The earlobe surgeries, the tummy tucks, the breast implants, all these people started to admit in private the things that they had done. Wow. I, think I was thinking, I'm the only person in the world that's ever going through sure. a rhinoplasty. Mm? No. So many people have had stuff done. And I mean, we can talk about how that it's, was created in society and all this stuff. Part of me was I didn't want to share this message that I was like upholding the patriarchy's ideal on perfectionism. And I was like, no, no, no. I wasn't doing it for Mike or Dean, I was doing it for me and me. And now I, and let me tell you, the moment I woke up in recovery and the nurse looked at me and she handed me a popsicle, which was the best tasting thing I've ever had in my life. It was the best thing in the world. Yeah. Blood draining from my face, swollen, just high as a kite. I was like, wow. It was like an elevated from my shoulder. I did this thing. The moral of the story is other than a nose job, where else? are we all facing this resistance, this avoidance? Where else in my life? I was like, holy crap, 30,000 foot view. Where else is this showing up in my life? Because that was a perfect example. So here's what happens is when we want to do this thing for ourselves, women especially tend to overthink it. And we think of all of these contingencies, plan A to Z. We've got it figured out. We know that if an earthquake comes, we are ready. We have everything packed. We're good to go. Men are scrambling. (laughs) The problem is that when you create undue stress, we all know this causes physical problems. So I was getting indigestion. I was getting hot flashes like I was going through perimenopause and I'm only 42. So I knew this may have been a little bit early. I stopped mm. getting my period and I'm like, mm, maybe it's an age thing. Two days before my surgery, after the world knew I was getting it, every symptom vanished. Gone. Wow. On my period, hot flashes gone, headaches gone, indigestion gone, just gone. The weight of that worry and the anxiety was causing me all that physical stress. Oh, my God. That is so powerful because, you know, in the new method, we tend to focus more on nutritional and supplements and movement and sleep. We do also talk a lot about stress, of course. But since it's not my area of expertise, we talk about it. But these type of stories really drive it home where you have these physical symptoms just from the stress of (laughs) holding something in. It's like amazing. And, I, you know, I just, so much of what you said resonated and we're, we're going to talk yeah. about it, but, you know, you reminded me when you told me the story about your, I'm, I actually never shared what I'm about to share, like on, on air. So you remind me when you told your parents gay no job is when I told my best friend that I was gay. I was still married to a man and is my best friend in my school. She's been in it forever. And I was like, I got to tell you something because it's like eating up. And I waited for months to tell her and she's like, and I'm like, I, I'm gay and I'm going to I'm gonna get a divorce. And it's like, I'm literally never told anyone's story. Now I'm sharing it on air. You just reminded me because maybe this will make somebody else feel powerful. Yeah. She's like, so what are we getting for breakfast? And I'm like, Karina. <laughs> Tacos, obviously. <laughs> but like, why, why did you not hear what I just told you? And she's like, oh, who isn't gay enough already? And she was like, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, awesome. What a great it. friend. <laughs> And it was like, what? Like the like the whole universe like lifted off of my shoulders. It's amazing the stories we tell ourselves. It's amazing that, you know. Most people don't care. People don't and care. when they do care, they forget about it two minutes later. They don't care. And they're like, fine. And if they love you, they're like, great. You're finally doing your thing. Amazing. Yeah. And amazing. also, she probably already knew. Most she people probably already know. <laughs> she knew. She knew. And so when I shared to my yeah. closest friends that I was getting a job, they all knew. Because their reaction was like, 
almost like, you know, the yeah. man or the woman's going to propose, but all your friends already know it's going to happen. And like, like, hey, did you like, not, so funny. do you not like my note? <laughs> so they're like, no, no, I think you're beautiful. We love you. But it's like, they just know. Yeah, 100%. And then, you know, like, oh my God, there's so much, there's so much to unpack. The saying, doing it for me is another big one. A lot of my clients, they've come to me after many years of going from doctor to doctor and their kids are probably older and like everyone's kind of settled and they're just done feeling achy all the time. And then they finally come to me and, you know, it costs, you need some resources to do it. It is expensive to kind of be in my program. And over and over again, they have to go through this process of finally being okay spending on themselves, of finally saying, okay, I'm going to do this, right? I'm going to cook the dinner for myself, even if it's not what everybody else wants. And like really taking a stand for themselves. And it's, they've taken care of everyone, their parents and their kids and their husbands. Now they're finally taking care of themselves. And the process itself is so powerful. The process of making that decision of saying, I am, you know, joining this program. I am getting the nose job. I'm going to do the thing. is so powerful, that choice. And so, yeah, it really is. So tell us a little bit about you. I think you told me also like you prepped your body before the surgery. Tell me what that looked like. So I was inspired by my friend, Emma, who years ago, I remember seeing this story on Instagram that she was going for a tooth extraction. Mm. And as with most surgeries, you have like cosmetic surgery, tooth extractions is you're required to take antibiotics afterwards, which pill or not, I don't know. I stand kind of indifferent in this. I know that if your body is physically in a good standing position, as we know, you might not need antibiotics. So she did everything she could. She talked to her doctor. She did all the research. How do I prep my body so that I don't need them? So she did everything. She was like a month prior. She was doing all these like detox and it was not easy, but she felt good. So she didn't have to take the antibiotics because she was doing all the protocols so that her body had no inflammation and all this stuff. So I was like, I want to do that. Not because I don't necessarily want to take the antibiotics. I did end up taking them. But I think that'll help expedite my recovery. It makes a lot of sense. And so I did that. Yeah. Months leading up to it, I started every day. There was a little something extra, like no booze or no this or no sugars. And then when I went into surgery, you also have to fast before going in, which is probably the hardest part of all of this. <laughs> fasting Because I couldn't even drink a sip of water for like 12 hours and that was tough. So my body was prepped and ready to go. So I would say, and in terms of recovery, I'm probably a week faster than the average person. Sure. And even post-surgery, and all surgeries are different too. Some people are more extreme. So it's actually a longer recovery process, all this stuff. But I had like all the right things lined up. So my recovery was quite fast. And I would say my bruising and swelling was gone almost after a week. And- no, that, that's absolutely amazing. I love that. And when I have people who are working with me and they need any type of surgery, the prep before the surgery is a big deal, right? There's a reason why in primary care, I still practice primary care every Monday. There's a reason why patients need surgical clearance before they go for surgery, right? So the average person, now we'll get to kind of what you did, but the average person, what we're clearing them for is can they survive the surgery or can their heart handle it? Are they diabetic? And there's times where like people's diabetes are out of control and you're like, I really don't think she get this surgery because you're never going to heal. So there are certain parameters in conventional medicine that we recognize that this is probably not a good candidate for surgery. And then when you put it on the plate of risk reward, like is this, you know, obviously if it's life saving, you're going to do it, but sometimes not everything is, it needs immediate attention. So like the model of taking a look at the human and saying, is this a good, are you going to likely, you know, succeed with the surgery already exists, but it only looks for pathology. Like, are you sick? And what you did, which is exactly everything in my world, is like, am I well enough? Like, I know I'm not sick, but did I optimize myself? It's like, I know I'm not going to die from this surgery. I don't have diabetes. I don't have high blood pressure. My heart's working well. But did I optimize myself enough to get through the surgery? And I love that. It was intuitive for you, but it's something that I try to confer to my patient all the time. Like, if you are dead, I, of course, get it under control. But for my people at the new method, it's really like exactly what we did. Like, this is the time to double down. There was absolutely no drinking 30 days before. And like this at the time to make it perfect. And you are not wrong. You 100% shortened your downtime. Oh, yeah. It was like the next day, but the day after as always, you're still kind of doped up. Whoopie, yeah. I remember we were driving back from Vancouver. So it's about a five hour drive from the surgery to where we live. 
and we stopped to fill up. So my husband was driving and I went into the convenience store to get some a snack. And the day after rhinoplasty, you do not look good. You're like, <laughs> you have a blood catcher under your nose, your pug being swollen. But I felt so good. So I walked in there and the guy behind the counter was looking at me funny, like side-eyed, like, what the heck? Like, what's and I turned to him and I said, this pointing in my face. I'm like, don't worry about it. I'm a professional MMA fighter. And I had a fight last night. It didn't end well. And he's like, and I said it with such conviction. Even my husband was like, that was good. He looked at me like, now like, he's ready to Google my name. <laughs> and then I said, no, no, I'm joking. I got my nose done. And my nose done. He's like, oh, so that was a better just saying it now. That was a better story. I might just go with that. <laughs> oh, that's but a good one. The day two and three sucked. And here's what's about this. When you actually have the foundation of like, great optimized health Mm. and you do something like this and you're not supposed to work out with intensity for six weeks that's hard like this has been four weeks now and i'm just getting back to the gym but i can't go back to crossfit for another couple weeks (laughs) yeah that that is hard but also taking that for yourself is really important there's a lot of healing that's a hard one for people who like to move yeah and not have the move is hard well the movement was key like constantly moving they actually said on the recovery that every two hours get up and walk for 10 minutes yeah that move is really important to prevent blood clots yeah but i was moving all day just like coasting just like i'll just maybe i'm so happy you know coasting go on the treadmill for like two seconds and but and i get it here's the thing is you need to deposit this is like a metaphor for everything in life is that you got to do work to have that foundation of great health for anything you do in your life like when I see these videos of women starting CrossFit when they're like 87 years old, I go, how? It's because they have the foundation of great health. Sure, they enjoy their cakes and they might have like a rum and coke every now and then. You, We are human. We can't enjoy these things. But that through line is like, figure your crap out. Get the foundation of health so that you can be so epic and live an amazing life. Have the most incredible health span. And oh my God, you can be yeah. a freaking superhero. I'm like smiling ear to ear because... One of the metaphors I use all the time is like, your health is like finances. Some of you are still in credit card debt. Some of you are living paycheck to paycheck. And some of you are able to save for your 401k. And this is important because if you're in debt, it's really not a time for me to talk to you about saving for your 401k. So if you're in severe pain, you still haven't figured out what's going on. This is not the time for me to have the longevity talk with you. So it's my job to kind of get you out of that credit card debt, help you get out of pain. And then those living paycheck are the ones like they're okay, but like one false meal or one bad weekend and they're really unwell again. Again, not the time to talk about longevity, but like how do we like avoid these flare ups, whether it's autoimmune or whatever. And then we have the patients. So either we got them out of there or they're already kind of like you, know, like you like they're they're okay. So now we have to talk about what are we saving for the future? What is the longevity game? Do you want to be 80 and be able to travel and pick up your suitcase and put it on top yeah. of the airplane without anybody helping you in that thing? If there is like a flight and they're changing you from gate to gate, are you making it right? Like what? So if you don't put it in right now, to your point, what is your longevity going to look like? And just a caveat for those listening, because I do have a lot of people who are really unwell. Don't get discouraged. We will get you out of unwellness in here. But a lot of times people are like, oh, I feel great. Do I still need to do things? Like, of course you do. We, yeah. do, we have to start saving now for the future. This is, this <laughs> is your start. life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. My friend Kira says it so well is most people don't know how good they can feel. Ah, I love that so much. Because if you're chronically always feeling like crap, you just think that you get used to it. Mm-hmm. And that is the worst thing. You get used to it. You're used to it. And all your friends feel like crap. So you've normalized it. Yep. And you start thinking that this is what 50 or 40 or 60 exactly. supposedly look like. Because Betty doesn't feel good and Susan doesn't feel good and you don't feel good. So this must be your age. Yep. And that is not the case. It's not your age, not your weight, not in your head. There are things that we can do. Oh my God, I love this so much. Yeah. So I actually, there's, it reminded me of this reel that I saved. I don't know who this doctor is. You probably will. Remind me after I'll find it to send it to you. But he said basically like about exercise, how important this is, that for every hour you exercise, you get three hours of your life back. Ooh, that's a good calculation. Something like that. And love that. when you pit somebody who exercises an hour a day, and I'm not talking CrossFit, I'm not talking training for an Ironman. Just move. Just movement. Get your heart rate up. Somebody who does that for an hour a day doesn't have to be consecutive versus somebody who seemingly looks healthy, might be thin, 
yep. who doesn't work out, but who yep. eats okay, the person who works out will have a longer health span. Without question. Yeah. Without question. Because what it does is releases chemicals, fixes your mitochondria, and yeah. pr- without question, everything you said is right. I have plenty. I tell my patients this all the time because we try to really stay away from the conversation of weight and they have plenty of thin people who are markedly unwell and plenty of heavier people who are killing it. Their yeah. inflammation is low. They're feeling great. And so, yeah, it, it's about the movement. It's not just about being thin. I love that. But I think the real metric that we can't measure is really being true to yourself and asking yourself, when you wake up in the morning, how good do you actually feel? How good do you feel? How what good is- do you feel? Yeah. Can't that just be the main metric we're going for? It is. If you're waking up and you're like, don't talk to me until I have coffee. <laughs> well, I hate that one. Don't give me a lot. Except for that one. <laughs> but there's levels. There's levels. Yeah. Look, I also need coffee. I'm definitely better post-coffee. Let me just, you know, put it out there. Yeah. But there's levels. And I know there's levels because the past two days on our business trip and nothing was optimized for me. Not my nutrition, not my sleep. I had some alcohol, alcohol of half a glass because I'm such a lightweight. Yeah, me too. But it was a very different wake up. I wake up and I'm like, I cannot even function. I had to have like three cups of coffee. That is a whole different level of unwellness. And it's like two or three days apart. So I love caffeine and I think it's a great nootropic. And there's a lot of studies that it's not a negative thing. But there was a different level of dependency for me in the past two days, a different level of in order to feel baseline well, I needed it. You know, and I think that that and as like, I never want to feel like this on a consistent basis. <laughs> but here's the thing, too. In all this is we all have an addiction to something. Ma'am. And let's just hope like let's not shame people or discourage people. If you don't feel well every day, you're thinking that's me. How dare you call me out? It's not about that. It's really about what you're doing. Dr. E's doing what I'm trying to convey is that you have the opportunity, the possibility is there to wake up and feel good. Because when you wake up and you feel good, guess what happens? You smile. You are happy. And this infiltrates all the people around you. Energetically, did you know this? On a frequency level, being authentic vibrates at a higher frequency than love. So being authentic to yourself Meaning like, you know, the things you have to do and you know, the things that fill up your love tank that make you happy, you are actually doing yourself, your family, your community, a service by waking up and feeling good. That's so true. And then when you smile, you make other people day brighter That's too. It. That's See, so we true. have a rule in our household, despite how terribly we sing. Have you ever actually known of a person who was singing and grumpy or angry? Oh, it's so true. I love that. If you're singing, you're happy. So the rule in our household is I don't care how much you suck at singing. If you're singing, we will encourage you to continue because then I know you're happy. Oh, that's awesome. So the metric for happiness in our household is how much are we singing on a day-to-day basis? Oh, my God. I love that. I love that. You know, and and in my business, every meeting that we have with the various teams, we have to start every meeting with wins doesn't matter how busy we are with wins. And sometimes they're like, oh, I don't have a win. I'm like, listen to me. If you're not in a hospital bed with tubes in and you're nonverbal, there's a win. And it shifts It shifts the whole meeting. Like, you know, instead of coming in like level 20, it's like, oh, and then I was with my son and I went with baseball. And it's like, and like, it just shifts the energy of the whole meeting. And it takes two seconds. That's it. I love that so much. So it's- let me ask you a question. Like your pure like your name is we wild women like where did that come from why women like why do women need like a special pr like why can't they just go to a right well i like women oh i obviously i know i'm talking to you i mean i i see some women on tiktok and i'm like i could probably go either way (laughs) they're so beautiful so here's why women to me i am a feminist i'm studying the ancestry and i think a lot of that time is when like did you know that there was a point during the medieval times that women were breadwinners for families because women were the midwives women did a lot of that stuff and it only came about when the patriarchy when the catholic church actually was threatened by women having a say and actually creating empowerment in society they're like no no no, and then put women in a box and now we're still fighting the fight but we're actually gonna get a little bit more liberated these days (laughs) So why women? Well, I used to run a PR agency that worked with only funded technology companies. So it was all a bunch of chads. 
30 year old Chad that didn't have children, a mortgage or a significant other. So you can imagine how they operated. It was a lot. And I loved a lot of my customers. Some of them I didn't. And I was like, I don't want to work with these men anymore. I don't. So when I started this agency, I looked at the name and I wanted to like, I liked the WWW for it being like kind of like nerdy online stuff. But each word has a significance. So we use the collective because I don't believe we do anything in life alone. And I really am adamant about bringing back the village. So the, the idea of bringing back the village. Do you know this, that even back in the medieval times, men spend more time with their families now than they ever have in history. Mm. But women knew also, like the village was, if you had a kid, it was also my responsibility yeah. to help raise that child. Yeah. It's not just you. So women actually got rest. And we don't have that now because we are expected to do it all. Mm-hmm. And also look good and feel good while we're doing it all. Like, come on. Yeah. So that was the we, the collective. Now the wild is like being bold, audacious, doing things that like a contrarian. Like you were, we're going up against the patriarchy. And not in a bad way, but in a way that's like, hey, we are all so awesome. We just happen to have a vagina. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> we have, we give birth. We create life. <laughs> and then women is like, that's who I like to work with. Different energy. It's different energy. I love that so much. The collective is really important. You know, like once a week, I have this live for my game changers where they could just hop on. It was initially set up just so they could ask me questions and have access to me every week. And it's a community. And sometimes someone will ask a question and the other women are answering. And there is like a sense also of like normal, like if they fall, they pick each other up and it's okay. And this is how I do it. And what do you think about that? And there is such a, and these women do not know each other. They're from all over the country. There's such an automatic collaboration. Like we got you. We don't know you, but we got you. You know, like it is something the how we nurture. I mean, you go to a hospital, right? And say you have a hospital stay for any length of time. Who are the people that you remember that helped you? The nurses. Exactly. And the nurses are predominantly women. They're not, they're gay men. Correct. Right? And then the doctors are mostly men. But Correct. Because women have, we. it's just part of our DNA to nurture and care and support. And it's not like there's just men are worse. It's just that we have it in us. It's different. It's just We're different. so different. There's a collaborative, there's a collaborative gene in there. Yeah. Just, like, I mean, think about even your community. I remember a story not that long ago. My friend Jacqueline knew that my husband was traveling a lot. Our house manager, who's an incredible person, was gone for over a month. And I had to run my business, do all the things that she would do, plus manage the house. And I was like, I got this. (laughs) Anyway, it got crazy. So she called me up a month prior and she's like, hey, are you free on this Friday? And I said, well, I have the kids. And she's like, no, 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 you don't. Ryan, my husband, so her husband, is going to take your boys because they have boys similar age and they're going to go do boy things, hockey stuff. I'm going to take you and we're going to go do something. We're going to go on a date. And I was like, oh my gosh, like nobody, nobody does this. Yeah, I go, and I felt guilty. She goes, don't worry. He wants to do this. We went and made pottery. Then we went out for ramen and we hung out. And what that is probably one of the most beautiful gifts I've received in so long is another woman recognizing the yeah. overwhelm in my life and just doing something like that. Yeah, that is beautiful, that recognizing. And then, and then of course, she was wise enough to put that whole thing together. Yeah. Cool. She's like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I don't want to just do the cliche, like, go out for dinner. Let's go rock climbing or do, like, pottery or pot- eat. I love like, that. Yeah, we got this. That is so good. That's the village. That's the village. But back in the day, <laughs> that would be a daily occurrence. Yeah, like, I got you, you got mine, we'll do it together. That's exactly. so good. Like a lot of sister wife. <laughs> okay, me. That's what I need to do. <laughs> That's a whole different podcast. Yeah. Well, maybe part two. <laughs> so uh, tell me, uh, like, we're going to, oh my God, I could talk to you forever, but in the interest of your time, is there a message or something that you want to leave my audience with? And I, and I love that we, took you know someone seemingly in pr to do with this but yet everything to do with this your entire experience is everyone all our it's all of our experience it's the we collective back to be collective what are the advice you recognizing want? that that's like let's double click on that for one second okay your experience is other people's experience because they're experiencing it through you right yes so like you're you're standing here, we're, we're sitting here and we're talking, we're experiencing this, but then we have listeners experiencing it. Yeah. They might take something away from this to make their life better. So then guess what happens? 
Tell me. Their family life gets better. Their community life gets better. So whatever you experience, other people do as well. So I love that because the, the, it's, you know, like the ripples in the, yeah. you know, throw Butterfly the effect. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. Like a lot of times I, I know I told you, it gives you, I'm going to give you a moment to think of your advice, but you know, I put a lot of content as do you podcast and I forget about it. And then I'll read comments because the comments sometimes come with their email. This video changed my life. This video gave me hope. This video. And you're like, you can't even imagine the ripple effect sometimes of the things that you say, as long as you stay positive. Thank you for pointing that out because you're right. Like that experience in that moment, I was just sharing a podcast and then six, seven months later, that changed someone's life. So yeah. Yes. And and that's just the person that told you that. Can you imagine all the people that never said anything? But never said anything. Yeah. I know it's so true. So what message. advice do you want to give our women? So I like to end on this. I have a favorite quote that I paraphrased by Stevie Nicks. She mm-hmm. says, if you are gracious, you've already won the game. And one of my missions in life is to leave a room better than it was before I arrived. So every room I enter, whether I'm alone, whether it's the bathroom, the literal rooms, this room, it could be the event I'm going to this evening. There's something I can do to make that room a better place. That's my mission. Whoa, why did I just get chills? It's so simple and so good. We used to have um, a plaque outside our garage because we always go through the garage house door to get into the house. And it read this, please be responsible for the energy you bring into this room Mm. because your BS is no one else's responsibility. (laughs) Do not bring that home with you. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Please be responsible for the energy you bring into this room. Oh my God. Second chills. I love that. (laughs) Second chills. I was like, oh, I felt that. I felt that so much. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. Okay, Renee, we're going to put all of your links. And so seriously, guys, I know this is not a business talk, but like I there's no way you are not moved by this. If you own a business, you if you own a business, you must work with Renee. If you know someone owns a business, you must work with Renee, because where are you going to get PR with a soul like this? It just doesn't exist. (laughs) It's I put soul into all my pitches. We actually get, we get replies from podcast hosts and journalists, by, even though if they're not interested in the person that I'm pitching, they will thank us for such a great personal pitch. Oh, mm-hmm. that is so awesome. Yeah, I love, it so much. I love it so much. Renee, thank you so much for your time. Oh, thanks for having me. Oh my God, it was an honor.